Hello, and welcome to another episode of Learn BMX Racing. This video is going to focus on the history of BMX bikes and the tracks. Now, while others have documented the overall history of the sport and the people who pioneered BMX, no one specifically focuses on bicycles and tracks. So I thought a little background could be a fun topic to teach people about. So if you do want to know more about the overall history of the sport and the key people involved, I highly recommend a great documentary about the history of BMX called Joe Kid on a Stingray, released in 2005 and directed by Mark Eaton and John Swar. And incidentally, if you're a skateboarder and you love the Stacy Peralta film Dogtown and Z-Boys, released in 2001, you will immediately notice Joe Kid on a Stingray uses a visual editing style which was highly influenced by Stacy Peralta. Now, I mention this only because if we're going to talk about the history of BMX bikes and tracks, it's important to understand that BMX has a very long history of being inspired by things which were first done in skateboarding. For example, uh, skaters invented skate parks and BMX riders wanted to ride bikes in them. After that first generation of skate parks started to shut down and skaters compensated by doing tricks on street obstacles, BMX freestylers started to imitate the same moves. Skaters use a pumping technique to maintain momentum on transitions, and BMX racers began to build tracks that allowed for bicycles to gain speed in the same way. Stacy Peralta created an innovative documentary style, and four years later, BMX copied that style. So, as a member of both the skateboarding and BMX communities, I find it fascinating that BMX is so heavily influenced by skateboarding. Now, hardcore skateboarders will tell you that BMX steals everything from skateboarding and BMX riders have no originality. I prefer to be a little more uh, diplomatic and say that BMX is inspired by skateboarding. And truth be told, following in the footsteps of skateboarders is a fact BMX historians rarely admit. So you see, <laughs> you're learning something already. So before talking about the history of BMX bicycles and tracks, we should answer a more fundamental history question. Where did the name BMX come from? because believe it or not, that is not the original name of the sport. Originally, BMX was called pedal cross. Let's talk about that in more detail. During the 1960s, people were putting knobby tires on motorcycles and racing them cross country on the dirt. These motorcycles became known as dirt bikes and the sport was called motocross, an abbreviation for motorcycling cross country. Motocross is often abbreviated as MX. The X obviously represents a cross shape. Children seeking to imitate motocross riders began racing bicycles through the dirt and their emulating of motocross became known as bicycle motocross, abbreviated as BMX. The word bicycle is a compound word referencing the tires. By meaning two and cycle meaning the cyclical rotation of tires, two cycles. And of course, motorcycle is a compound word for motorized bicycle. So technically, BMX stands for two cycle, motorized two cycle cross country. 
which is grammatically ludicrous, but technically that's what BMX means. As I said earlier, bicycle motocross was originally called pedal cross, which makes a lot more sense from a descriptive standpoint, since it more accurately describes the source of locomotion. Motocross for motorcycles, pedal cross for bicycles. But the name pedal cross didn't stick, and BMX became the name of the sport. Most people think BMX started in the late 1960s in California, when children began racing bicycles at Palms Park in Santa Monica, imitating their motocross idols. However, there is documented proof that kids were running organized bicycle races, which emulated motocross, back in the 1950s in the city of Amersfoort in the Netherlands. So why then is California credited with creating BMX instead of the Netherlands? Well, by all accounts, the Netherlands races appear to have been a short-lived fad which vanished after a brief period of time. Since the BMX races which began in Santa Monica and the people who started those races can document a continuous history and lineage up to the Olympic BMX races of today, California gets credit for the creation of modern BMX. Now that you know where the name BMX comes from, let's get into the timeline history of the bikes. Although there have been countless crazy variations of bicycle designs in the last 200 years, there have only been four major innovations which truly altered the basic functionality of the bicycle. The very first bicycle was the Laufs machine, created around 200 years ago in 1817 in Mannheim, Germany. The Laufs machine had no pedals and would be pushed along by your feet, and people who ridiculed these contraptions called them a dandy horse because they were typically ridden by well-to-do gentlemen. Around 1857, the world saw the second innovation in bicycling, the velocipede, which was essentially a Laufs machine with pedals added to the front wheel. This was an enormous breakthrough because the rider could now keep their body on the bike and didn't have to push along the ground with their feet to gain speed. By 1869, we saw the third iteration of bicycle, the penny farthing, which increased the diameter of the front wheel, making it a much faster version of the velocipede. Penny farthings are quite difficult to balance since they put the rider very high off the ground and directly over the front wheel. Plus, once the radius of the wheel is longer than your inseam, you can't fit on the bike. <laughs> so both of these problems were solved in 1885 when the world was introduced to the safety bicycle, which looks very much like a modern day beach cruiser. The huge innovation of the safety bicycle was moving the pedals beneath the seat and adding a chain to drive the rear wheel. That changed everything. Not only was the safety bicycle faster than any other bicycle ever made, they could now create smaller tires with a matching diameter and had brakes, making the bikes far safer than a penny farthing, hence the name safety bicycle. Now, bicycles of 2021 still share features similar to the 1885 safety bicycle. Not much has changed since then. However, starting in the 1900s, bicycles began to develop subtle design improvements, making them much more specialized to riders and styles of riding. The first Tour de France bicycle race was held in 1903 and was won on a bicycle which basically was a safety bicycle with curved bullhorn handlebars. And there were also smaller versions designed for children with tires that were about 20 inches in diameter. 
The family tree of these two machines have influenced the design of every popular bicycle for the past 120 years. Now these two basic designs of adult bicycles with 700 millimeter diameter wheels called 700C and 20 inch diameter wheels on children's bikes remained unchanged for decades. And to this day, the 20 inch tire diameter is so common, many cycling enthusiasts simply call their BMX bicycle a 20 inch bike. The most dramatic evolution of rider specific bicycle designs came in the 1960s with the introduction of the 10 speed and the 20 inch Schwinn Stingray. Everything from BMX race bikes to mountain bikes trace their lineage back to 10 speeds and stingrays. So let's quickly discuss the 10 speed timeline first and come back to the stingray line in more detail afterward. A 1960s 10 speed bicycle looks very similar to the racing bicycle used in the Tour de France 60 years earlier. The 700C tire diameter and bullhorn handlebars are the same. The biggest difference is in the gearing. There are two chain rings on the front and five cogs in the back for a total of 10 gears, hence the name 10 speed. Now, just like motorcycle transmissions, this ability to change gears allowed for riders to alter their cadence depending upon the terrain. And by the 1970s, manufacturers began to add more gears. 12, 15, 18, 21 gears. And once this happened, it no longer made any sense to call them 10 speeds, so the name was changed to a road bike. The 1980s saw the introduction of mountain bikes, which are essentially a cross between a road bike and a BMX bike. Mountain bikes have multiple gears, like a road bike, but more rugged and robust frames, like BMX bikes. The average tire diameter is about 26 inches, so it's larger than a BMX bike, but smaller than a 700C road bike. The tires are also very wide, like BMX tires, allowing mountain bikes to maintain good grip on mountain trails and racing downhill. Now in the late 80s and early 90s, we started to see trials bikes. Not trails, but trials. Now just like BMX was inspired by motocross, bicycle trials were inspired by trials dirt bikes. Now trials dirt bikes look similar to ordinary dirt bikes, but they have no seat. You need to stand on the bike the whole time. And once you see the incredible obstacles they ride on Trials dirt bikes, you understand why there's no seat. Some 26 inch Trials bicycles have seats, but they're extremely low and the frame itself is squished so that the front and rear triangles of the bike are extremely small. Just like their dirt bike counterparts, this is done so riders can compress their body against the bike as far as possible. Around the turn of the 21st century, two new styles of road and mountain bikes appeared. Cyclocross bikes are basically road bikes with knobby tires like a mountain bike. Now, while true cyclocross bikes have bullhorn handlebars, you also see cyclocross bikes with flat bars like mountain bikes. And these are sometimes called gravel bikes or urban bikes. And they are one of my personal favorite bicycle styles. I love these cyclocross gravel bikes because they are the best of both worlds. You have the light weight and the speed of a road bike combined with the stability and ruggedness of a mountain bike. And this combination of features makes them ideal for rides like commuting to work. Hence the reason they are called urban bikes. And fixies also gained popularity around that time and are basically a throwback to the old Tour de France bikes or velodrome bikes. 
They gained popularity among bicycle couriers in major cities and expanded out to a recreational fad. The latest new style of 26-inch bikes are called fat bikes. Now, fat bikes are basically mountain bikes, but with tires that are around three or four inches in width. And having such a large surface area on the tires allows riders to bicycle on terrain such as snow or sand, which was never rideable with any other bicycle. Coming back to the BMX part of the timeline, while the Schwinn Stingray was not the first 20-inch bicycle ever made, in fact, Huffy built a 20-inch bike in the 1950s called the Huffy Convertible, the Stingray is the bike credited with starting BMX in California because it was the first commercially manufactured bicycle rugged enough to be used off-road. the Stingray was a rugged bicycle for the time, as BMX riders began to improve their skills and ride more aggressively, well, those 1960s Stingray bikes started to fall apart constantly. So in the 1970s, many of the first BMX bicycle companies were started by the fathers of BMX racers, mostly by men who were engineers or welders. Now, these dads were constantly trying to fix and improve upon BMX bicycle designs because they had to keep on repairing their kid's Stingray. So manufacturers like Mongoose, Redline, SE, and GT, they all began to build the first generation of reliable and strong BMX race bikes. The BMX what we got here is your wonderful bike made in America. This bike will get you from point A to point B. Not. Or GT4130 American made Chrome Armor. GT Megabyte Tire. Power Series Cranks. Odyssey Pitbull Brakes. Yeah. And GT will get you from point A to point B. A little fun in between. Kids had a very hard time getting their hands on these bikes because they cost upwards of $300 to $400 and could only be found in bike shops. 
Now, most parents didn't want to shell out that kind of money on a bike when they saw an $80 Huffy or Murray in Kmart promoted by slick television ads. They have over a thousand trophies and number one plates. They're Team Murray pros. When the stakes are high and reputations are on the line, they ride Murray bikes like X20R, track certified, oversized down tube, alloy caliber brakes, monster chrome fork, wide track knobbies. Team Murray X20R, made for champions like you. Get on the bike you're paying for, Murray. Stu Thompson, number one BMX pro, was challenged by Huffy to create a great bike. Huffy BMX bikes, Stu Thompson series, white paint job, pinstripe pads, rigid power system for maximum performance. The result? A flash of white lightning. A bike so free, it could only be built for you by Huffy and Stu. The two number ones in BMX racing. Totally awesome. Huffy, America's first choice. Team Murray BMX. It's real bicycle motocross. And motocross is no place for toys. Team Murray bikes are built for dirt track riding with reinforced frame and BMX front fork. The longer pedal cranks give you more power in the curves and it's easy to change sprockets with the adjustable rear wheel clip. If you race the dirt track, ride a Murray BMX. Built Murray tough. See Murray bikes at JCPenney stores and catalog desks. As they say... You get what you pay for. And despite impressive advertising, the quality of cheap Huffy and Murray bikes could never compare to a Redline, Haro, or GT. It really stinks that none of these formerly all-American companies make bicycles in the United States anymore. It's now impossible to buy a 100% American-made bicycle as some components are no longer made in the United States by anyone. If you would like to support American-made BMX companies, you can come to Learn BMX Racing and click the link right here that is Made in the USA. And on this page, there is a list of companies that make bike frames in the United States. And down below the bike frames, we have a list of companies that make different parts all in the USA. Now, while the quality of bikes differed greatly, designs of BMX race bikes made in the 70s and the 1980s were quite similar. The next big change in BMX bikes came in the 1980s, when a few racers invented a new subgenre of the sport, which became known as BMX freestyle, or just freestyling. Now, as BMX racing became more and more popular in the early 1980s, riders at large races, they, well, they just started to get bored waiting for their moto. So they began doing tricks on their bicycles out in the parking lots just to pass the time. And the next thing you know, instead of focusing on racing, riders were modifying their bikes to do more and more tricks. They started to put platforms and pegs on the bicycle to stand on. They created brake systems, which allowed the handlebars to spin without tangling up the brake cables. And when freestyle first came into being, there were really two disciplines of the sport. There was flatland and transition. Now, remember when I said that a lot of BMX is inspired by skateboarding? Well, this is a great example. Skateboarding in the early 80s also consisted of flatland freestyle and transition skating. Now, people like Rodney Mullen were innovating freestyle skateboarding and doing tricks on skateboards on flat ground. Other skaters were riding skate parks, which is known as transition because the surface you are skating upon is literally transitioning from horizontal to vertical. So flatland freestyle you know, it didn't rely upon a dirt track. It could be learned in any empty parking lot. And since there are a lot more empty parking lots than BMX tracks, you know, the sport of BMX flatland freestyle became more popular than BMX racing. It's great! It's exciting. It's daredevilish. I think it's great. 
Now, writing transition in freestyle BMX meant riders were building ramps and going into skate parks and learning to emulate skateboarding tricks. And transition, it, it actually has a lot of names. I mean, some people call it skate park riding or park riding or just riding ramps. Uh, some people call it vert because the surface curves up to vertical. But no matter if it's called vert or transition or ramp or skate park, the tricks are pretty much the same. Now, I personally, I used to do flatland and a little bit of quarter pipe ramp riding on my 1987 Harrell Master freestyle bike, but I was never very good at either one. <laughs> Around the time trials styles of mountain bikes were invented came the birth of 20-inch trials bikes. Now, although trials bicycles have been around for decades, they still remain a largely unknown and underground kind of sport. I mean, every time I see a trials video posted on social media, someone always comments about how they've never seen this kind of thing before. And I'm willing to bet that some of you watching this have never seen these styles of bicycles or the style of riding either, even though it has been around for 30 years. Now, like their larger cousins, the 20-inch trials are done in urban areas and out in the woods and at indoor contests. And again, this type of bike frame became a major influence on BMX racing bikes. Personally, I've never done trials riding, but I have an immense respect for this. It's like parkour on a bicycle. It's absolutely amazing to me. I mean, I know that I could not do half of this stuff without a bicycle, let alone lugging around uh, 20 pounds of metal and rubber with me. I mean, I just, I'm totally blown away by the fact that they can do this. I think it's really cool. In the late 90s and early 21st century, BMX bikes evolved into three very distinct styles. There were BMX race bikes, BMX freestyle bikes, which are sometimes called street or park bikes, and trails bikes. Now, <laughs> note, <laughs> these, are, these are trails bikes and not trials bikes. And sometimes they're called jump bikes or dirt bikes. Now, to the untrained eye, they may look very, very similar, but these three types of bikes are really very different. So how can you tell them apart? Well, there's a few little things that can drop a hint for you. Race bikes always have a large front chain ring and rear brakes. Okay, those two features alone set them apart from park and dirt bikes. You can also spot a race bike by what it never has, namely axle pegs on the front or rear of the bike. Now freestyle and dirt bikes can be difficult to distinguish because they often share similar features. So dirt or jump bikes typically have a small front chain ring and rear brakes often with a device called a gyro, which allows the bars to spin without tangling the brake cable. And they usually have wider tires than freestyle bikes too. Freestyle bikes are often brakeless and they have a small front chain ring and they have axle pegs. But Everything that I just mentioned, I mean, those are just general rules. I mean, you noticed I kept using words like often and typically and usually, right? It's because these guidelines, I mean, they're not even consistent among bicycle manufacturers. For example, Free Agent categorizes their bikes as street park, team, race, BMX, and youth. And if we look at the street park bikes, you can see here, they're all pretty much the same, right? They've all got small sprockets. They all have rear brakes and none of them seem to have axle pegs. Okay, now that's their street park bikes. If we look at 
BMX, like what's the difference between BMX and street park? Well, there doesn't seem to be a really discernible difference. I mean, this bike looks like a race bike because it has a large front sprocket and it does have rear brakes. But if we look at this one, this one's actually got a small sprocket. It has rear brakes and a gyro. So two very different bikes, but they're still listed as BMX bikes. We the People is one of those sort of bike companies that actually don't categorize their BMX bikes at all. But if we look at something like the Battleship bike, we can see here that it is brakeless. It has a small sprocket. And if we scroll through all the photos, it has axle pegs, but it only has them on one side of the bike. Sunday BMX bikes are very inconsistent. Here we have a signature model that has no axle pegs. It has a small sprocket and it has rear brakes. And if we come down and we look at all the other kind of bikes that they offer, again, they don't categorize their bikes, but we can see that they pretty much all look the same, right? They've all got rear brakes. They all have the small kind of micro sprockets and they don't have axle pegs. Now, here's one exception right here. This one has no brakes, but it does have axle pegs. Finally, we'll take a look at the Haro site and look at all of their categories of bikes. Now, if we click on race, you can see here that this is pretty much what we would expect. We have a very large front chain ring on all of the race bikes and we have rear brakes on every single bike. Now, if we look at their freestyle bikes, well, that's where things get a little bit more foggy, right? Because some of the freestyle bikes, like this one, for example, it has axle pegs in the front and the back, it has a small sprocket, and it has no brakes. But if we look down a little further on the list, we could see that there are bikes here that do have brakes and they're still considered freestyle bikes, but they don't have axle pegs. So this one, for example, you can see no axle pegs and it does have brakes. So it's kind of the exact opposite of this Plaza free coaster. And then if we come down a little further, say to this bike, the downtown DLX, this one, is more of an old school kind of freestyle bike because it has axle pegs on the front and the back on both sides of the bike. It has a smaller gearing and that small sprocket, but we also have front and rear brakes in addition to having a gyro, which allows the bars to spin around without tangling up the brake cables. So, as you can see, all of these bikes have some pretty drastically different pieces of equipment on them, even though all of them are considered freestyle bikes. These differences in features arose from the way the bikes are used. I mean, race bikes are obviously used for racing <laughs> and dirt or jump bikes are used for jump trails, which I will cover in more detail later when we talk about tracks. And finally, the freestyle bikes are used on bike park terrain and street courses and flatland. Now, one interesting evolution in freestyle is the popularity of each discipline. So while flatland was the most popular form of freestyle in the 80s because there were no skate parks, today every major city has multiple skate parks. So park riding is probably the most popular form of BMX freestyle. Although park riders don't tend to launch as high into the air as they did in the 80s, and they focus more on grinds and spinning and lip tricks, which is obviously influenced by street riding. So different disciplines also use the equipment differently. Take the axle pegs, for example. Flatland freestylers use their axle pegs as platforms to stand on and step all around the bike. Park and street riders use their pegs to lock onto coping or railings in order to grind. And if you are a racer, 
old pegs are forbidden on BMX race bikes because <laughs> no one wants to land on a pile of axle pegs when they crash. And how about the gears? So why is the gearing so tiny on freestyle bikes? Well, the main reason the gear ratios were shrunken on freestyle bikes is so street riders reduce their chances of hitting their sprockets on obstacles when they are doing street tricks. Back in the 1990s, before they got the idea to reduce the overall gear ratio, Haro released a few bikes with a bash guard, which was an extra frame tube running just under the sprocket to protect it from damage. And why don't race bikes follow this trend of smaller gears? Well, there's two reasons. First of all, a smaller cog and sprocket puts much greater stress on the chain, making it more likely to break. And second, as racers improve their skills, they often need to make subtle adjustments to their gear ratios in order to increase the speed of their bicycles, and the increments of those changes are too large when you run very small gearing. Incidentally, a Dutch racer in the 2020 Olympics used multiple gears on his BMX race bike. Now, uneducated people in the media said it was a great innovation, but putting gears on a BMX bike is not innovative at all. There were geared stingrays in the 1960s. And the Dutch rider came in last place, by the way. <laughs> so, another distinction modern BMX race bikes share is a tendency to angle the nose of the seat way up in the air. I mean, even in promotional photographs of bicycles, they angle the seats this way. Now, this may seem really stupid, but there is actually a practical reason for it. Since BMX racers really only sit on their seat in the starting gate and the gates are angled, this makes the seat horizontal when you are sitting in most gates. Now, personally, I keep my seat horizontal all the time because I don't find any benefit to the angled seat thing. Now, you will sometimes see angled seats on freestyle and dirt bikes, but those really serve no purpose and are usually set up that way by people who just don't know any better. <laughs> now, modern freestyle bikes, they often lack brakes as well, which really limits the rider's options and makes it impossible to perform some of the tricks which were done on 80s freestyle bikes. Obviously, you can still choose to not use your brakes, so removing the brakes is just another fad which serves no practical purpose. Now, aesthetically, the color scheme of some freestyle bikes changed dramatically too. I mean, modern freestyle bikes are primarily decorated in somber, dark colors. They're matte finishes, black and grays and muted earth tones. Like if a modern freestyle bike, if they all look like, you know, Kylo Ren, they're all mopey and sad. The 80s freestyle bikes, and <laughs> they were all Cindy Lauper. Man, freestyle bikes were just, they were dazzling. Fluorescent pinks and acid greens and neon blues. I mean, they had charm, flash. Each bike was unique and special. They stood out. I mean, you could easily identify one bike from another. They were kaleidoscopes of joy and brightness and hope and fun. 80s freestyle bikes had the aesthetics of laughter and sunshine incarnate. They were absolutely beautiful. Now, thankfully, modern BMX race bikes carry on the tradition of 80s BMX freestyle bikes. I mean, I still see crazy and bold splashes of color zipping around the BMX track. Another distinct difference between the first generation of race bikes from the 70s and 80s is the height of the frame triangles. Now, if we put the bike side by side would say the red silhouette representing an 80s bike and the blue being a 2021 bike, you immediately notice the seat tube 
of present day BMX bikes is much shorter, squishing the entire frame like a trials bike. Well, okay, not, <laughs> not as much, <laughs> not as much as a trials bike, but still the blue modern bike has smaller triangles than the red 80s race bikes. And again, just to be clear, when I talk about the triangles of the bike, I'm talking about these two triangles, right? There's the front triangle, the frame, and the rear triangle, and they were much taller on 80s bikes, and they got squished down on modern bikes. Those are the triangles. The frames did not get smaller in order to make it easier to jump. That's a common misconception, but 70s and 80s riders, they could jump just as high as people today. They would just tuck their bodies behind the seat. So why did the frames change? This is why that happened. I know that's what you're wondering, right? Like, why did the frames of the bike get squished so, so small, right? Why is the seat tube so short? This is why. So you can compress really far on the bicycle as you are going through rhythm sections, whoop de doos moguls. The riding style changed. And as a result of having to pump through different parts of the track, it made it a lot more efficient if you could compress your body lower on the frame of the bike. So that's why the seats drop so low. That's why the frames got squished down so tiny. And don't try to sit down on your seat when it's slammed all the way down to your frame like this. Okay, the whole point is that you're standing on your pedals and racing. If you actually want to sit down on your seat while you're riding and not have your knees explode, you need to raise it up like this, like a, you know, normal person. This is the way you set up your seat when you want to sit down, and this is the way you set up your seat when you want to race, okay? <laughs> you, you, you follow? You got that? All right, good. BMX bikes have also adopted two elements from road bikes, namely skinnier rims and, for more experienced riders, clip-in pedals. Now, if you look at the rim width of most first-generation BMX race bikes, they are far wider than the rims on modern BMX bikes. And many road bike racers use special pedals and shoes which clip together. In theory, this allows a rider to gain much more speed because instead of just pushing down with each pedal stroke, they are also able to pull up with the ascending leg. So now you see how BMX bikes influenced road bikes and how road bikes influenced BMX bikes. The other big change in BMX bikes today is simply the massive, massive quantity of size options. I mean, holy cow, there are so many different types of bikes. You know, when I was a kid, you had 16-inch bikes and 20-inch bikes, and that was it. I mean, if you couldn't fit on those bikes, you couldn't ride. Now, there are even 12-inch and 18-inch bikes, so you can find almost any size your particular kid, that rider, might need to learn how to ride on. And many BMX racers also race on 24-inch bikes, which are called cruisers. So in the past decade, the two biggest innovations in BMX are probably balance bikes and the mini 20-inch bikes. Now, balance bikes, they have no chain and no pedals, and they are a brilliant innovation, allowing toddlers as young as two years old to learn to race and balance. Hmm, brilliant innovation. Or are they? If you look closely, in truth, balance bikes are just dandy horses, right? They actually aren't very innovative or new. In truth, they are the rediscovery of 200-year-old technology. Now, you may often hear people call these bikes uh, Striders, since that is the brand name of the first company to dominate the balance bike market. Now, since balance bikes have 
really only been around for about a decade. Anyone over the age of about 16 is too old to have learned on one. For most of us over the age of 16, we didn't even learn to ride a bike until we were about six years old because you had to be physically tall enough to ride the 16-inch bikes that were available. But thanks to balance bikes and all these little 12-inch bikes, children can begin to learn how to ride at a much earlier age. Mini 20-inch bikes are a genuinely new innovation. Now, if we look at an adult-sized 20-inch bike and we line up the rear axle with a mini BMX bike, you can see that even though both bikes have wheels which are 20 inches in diameter, the wheelbase of the Mini is drastically shorter. The seat and the handlebars are vastly shorter too. And so all of these kind of shrunken geometries, well, they're designed to allow young riders the chance to fit on a larger wheel diameter bike. The newest variation of BMX bikes, I guess, I mean, I don't even know if you can call these BMX bikes. <laughs> They're these, these odd little mini bikes with these like big dolly wheels on them. And honestly, I'm not even sure what these bikes are called. You know, they're kind of so new that they don't really have a consistent name. Some people call them mini bikes. Some people call them rocket bikes or fat boy bikes, which is again based on two popular brand names. Now they're similar in size to balance bikes, but they actually have chains and pedals and they're strong enough to support the weight of a full grown adult. And they also happen to be extremely expensive. <laughs> they cost about as much as a full size bicycle. Yeah, I don't really get the point, but if I'm going to talk about the history of bikes, they're part of the history. Now that we've been through everything on the history of the BMX bikes, let's, let's review, shall we? So, we start out BMX, bicycle motocross, with the Stingray. Now, BMX really started out being about racing, and there are basically three types of racing BMX bikes. There's a 20 inch bike, which is called a class bike. There's also a 24 inch bike, which is called a cruiser. And then there are the small little balance bikes for toddlers. Now coming off of racing, racing developed and evolved into freestyle. Freestyle has, again, three disciplines. There's flatland, there's park riding, and there is street riding. And then another subgenre of racing was dirt and jump trails. Okay, so those have a specialized type of bike as well. And finally, I'm kind of curious as to what the future holds, and will pump tracks become a really predominant way that people end up racing and riding around on their bikes. Now, I haven't covered pump tracks yet. We'll get into that a little bit later. But basically, pump tracks are kind of like a combination between a skate park and a BMX racetrack. And they're usually made out of asphalt or cement, so they're much easier to maintain. So more and more pump tracks are being created in different communities around the world, and I wouldn't be surprised if pump tracks became a lot more popular in the future. Well, now you have a good understanding of the history of BMX bikes. So let's move on to the history of BMX tracks. I am at lovely Santa Clarita Bike Park in Santa Clarita, California. And this is the best place that I could think of to start to talk about the history of the tracks because this location can show you what is not a BMX track in addition to what is a BMX track. But before we get into that, I would like to briefly touch upon some of the organizations that have been responsible for kind of overseeing BMX because 
when you understand that, it really informs the history of how the tracks were designed and built. For citizens of the United States, if you are racing BMX at the local BMX track in your town, you will be racing at a track which is overseen by USA BMX. Whether you are competing in races in your local district or your state or even a national competition, all of those races fall under the umbrella of USA BMX. Now, Suppose you become an exceptional professional BMX racer and you want to start competing in international competitions in other countries. Then you will be participating in events overseen by USA Cycling. USA Cycling doesn't just cover BMX races. USA Cycling governs all competitive cycling events in the country. BMX racing, mountain biking, road biking, velodrome racing, all of those disciplines fall under the jurisdiction of USA Cycling. And if you want to earn a spot on Team USA and represent America in the Olympics, your spot will be determined by USA Cycling. Finally, if a bicycle competition is happening on the world stage, like a World Cup race or the Olympics, those events are run by the Union Cycliste Internationale, or UCI, headquartered in France. When the Olympic Committee needs a BMX track built or a road bike course to be decided, it is the UCI overseeing those decisions. I don't want to go into a ton of detail about this, but I feel it's important to understand what level of racing these organizations encompass so you can understand that USA BMX, for example, has some jurisdiction over the layout of your local BMX racetrack, but they have nothing to do with the design or style of BMX tracks you see in the Olympics. So what makes a present-day BMX racetrack? Well, whether it's a brand new track or one that is 40 years old, all BMX racetracks share similar features. They all have a modest starting hill capped by a starting gate. The starting gate always has eight lanes across, and obviously this means the track itself is wide enough to allow for eight riders to start side by side. Now, most of the jumps are all fairly mellow in height with transitions which ease up and down, allowing less experienced riders to simply roll over the jumps and keep both tires on the ground. In fact, remaining earthbound may be one of the biggest misconceptions about BMX racing. Since most races shown on television are really spectacular races like the Olympics with massive jumps, people who are new to the sport often assume that you have to jump your bicycle 20 feet through the air. And this is not true at all. In fact, most races on the local level take place completely on Mother Earth, and only the best riders ever get airborne. Now, occasionally, tracks have a secondary hill or a line called a pro set, which contains very steep jumps, and those do require riders to get airborne to clear them. But tracks containing pro sets are very rare exceptions to the rule. Now, most tracks will contain about three 180-degree turns and four straightaways. One of those straights usually contains a rhythm section, which used to be called whoop de doos or moguls. And these are a sequential series of roller jumps, which are all similar in height and spacing. Now, the overall length of average BMX racetracks tends to be around 800 to 1500 feet with a distinct finish line marking the end of the race course. So the tracks, they're never, they're never loops. 
meaning the finish line and the starting line are always in different locations. Unlike most racetracks, whether it's cars or motorcycles or horses or whatever, they tend to begin and end in a loop from the same spot. And finally, the surface of these tracks all tend to be made from dirt. Whether it's clay or limestone or heavy topsoil, they are all slurried from some type of mud. Remember the name BMX, motocross, cross country, therefore they're all dirt because you're not racing on streets or roads, you're racing cross country. So a course which does not contain all of those elements is not a BMX racetrack. For example, here are three types of terrain which are designed for people to ride and race bicycles upon, but they are not BMX racetracks. So we have pump tracks, we have dirt jump trails, and mountain bike trails. Now, as a beginner who is new to the sport of BMX racing, you might not know how to differentiate these unique types of cycling terrain. Pump tracks are typically made of asphalt or concrete, although you will occasionally see pump tracks made of dirt or even made out of wood. Now, as the name implies, Pump tracks are designed to be ridden by pumping your momentum over the jumps. So the whole intent is that you never rotate your pedals. Pump tracks also tend to be very narrow. So unlike a racetrack, people are not able to ride side by side. It's just one rider at a time. Often, Pump tracks also lack a designated start and finish and allow for riders to pick their own course over the series of moguls, jumps, and transitions. So, let's give that a try. I should note that I've actually never ridden a pump track before. Uh, the first time that I ever rode this track was about five minutes before I shot this video. But <laughs> the thing that I want you to really watch is my feet. Notice that I never pedal a single time throughout this entire track. So there I completed one entire lap, didn't pedal at all. And now I'll do another without pedaling. So I'm just pumping through the whole thing. Now, like I said, this is literally the second time in my entire life that I've ever ridden a pump track. So my form is not great. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not riding it as smoothly and as stylishly as I would hope. But nevertheless, I am able to keep my speed, keep my momentum without pedaling and just pumping through the entire length of the track. So let's give another pump track a try, this time one made out of dirt. This track, this one actually is my very first time riding it. So as you can see in the background there, there's the asphalt track that I just rode. And now we're gonna give it a try on the dirt one. So I did pedal as I got up to the track, but again, pay very close attention to my feet and my legs and you'll notice that I never actually rotate the pedals at all. I'm simply pumping through all of the rollers on the track and that's how I'm maintaining my momentum. So this is the principle of a pump track. This is how pump tracks work. And this is also the exact same concept behind the rhythm section on a BMX racetrack that you just pump through it to keep your speed up. So, and uh, that right there, that is the peanut pool here at uh, Fontana North in lovely Fontana, California. As I said, this concept of pumping originated with skateboarding and pumping transition. So here is an example of me pumping in a pool. So it's about six feet in the shallow end. It's about 12 or 13 feet in the deep end. And you can see 
I maintain my speed, I keep on going, I'm getting all the way up to the tile of the pool, and obviously I'm not pushing off with my feet. I am just pumping my weight through the transitions. Dirt jump trails are often mistaken for BMX racetracks by those who are just learning about BMX. The most obvious difference is the angle of the jumps. Okay, so dirt jump tracks force riders to jump, catch air, to leave the ground. Unlike a BMX racetrack where inexperienced riders can easily roll up and over the jumps, the jumps on a dirt jump track are so steep that you cannot do that. You can't roll over them. So again, like a pump track, a dirt jump track is usually a very skinny single lane and it can only accommodate one rider at a time. You can't ride side by side. And also, there are often numerous lines and options you can choose with no definitive start or finish lines. Mountain bike trails do have a start and finish, but they're often single track courses which careen down a mountain for these immensely long distances, up to miles in length. And while one could conceivably use a BMX bike on a beginner mountain bike course, <laughs> uh, the more advanced trails require full-fledged mountain bikes with suspension systems to absorb all the pounding and landing from riding these massive jumps. Now you should have a much clearer understanding of what is a BMX racetrack and what kind of terrain is not a BMX racetrack. So now that we've covered all this and, and you understand the difference between these types of terrain, now let's move into the history of BMX racetracks and how they evolved over time. The first BMX races were held in a public park in Santa Monica, California called Palms Park. And the courses back then were mostly flat. You know, there were no big jumps or berms or anything like that. And jumps, in fact, were the very first new feature to be added to BMX tracks. And they were added, I mean, almost immediately, in fact. The course at Palms Park may have been one of the only places that didn't really have significant jumps. And let's face it, jumps are obviously the first thing that you want to develop because it's one of the most fundamental elements of BMX. Whether you're hitting that really great curb in your neighborhood that you know you can launch off of and get the most air, or getting together with your friends and bombing down that hill in the woods, it's all about hitting those jumps. The next change, which also happened very early in the first years of BMX, was downhill racing. Now, downhill was one of the most intense disciplines of BMX racing, where riders began to bomb down fire roads in the California mountains. And these races were fast and dangerous, and they looked like a load of fun. <laughs> Perhaps the uh, danger factor is what caused them to fade from being part of mainstream races, but I sure wish they'd bring back these styles of tracks because they really look like they're a blast. Now, berms or the kind of sloped turns were added later, and they evolved kind of slowly. Today, berms can be 10 to 15 feet high, but when they were first added to tracks, they only measured a couple of feet tall. And just like on a race car track, berms allow riders to maintain their full speed through the entire radius of a turn without having to slow down. And before the berms appeared, the turns were all flat. In fact, if you watched some of the older races in the 1970s, you can still see flat turns where riders would put a foot down and kind of power slide through the curve. It's something that I fondly remember doing with friends when I was a kid, just, you know, power sliding, hit the brakes, and you kind of slide out the back tire. 
It was really fun, uh, something that you can't really do in berms all that easily. Now, the rhythm section was invented right around the same time the seats of BMX bikes began to get lowered down to the top tube. So the rhythm section consists of a series of small and evenly sized jumps, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, and they're set up in this wave-like sequence in a straightaway. And much like a pump track, the concept behind the rhythm section is to gain speed through pumping, not by pedaling. In 2003, a waterproof glue called soil tack was invented to help strengthen the integrity of dirt roads and suppress dust at construction sites. Now, soil tack eventually also became a popular way to coat the surface of a dirt BMX track. So soil tack can be lightly kind of sprayed on the surface, so it's hardly even noticeable. It sort of just absorbs into the dirt, and the track still looks and feels very much like an ordinary dirt track. It just doesn't crumble apart quite as easily. But alternatively, soil tack can also be churned and mixed into a really thick slurry of mud, which is several inches thick, and that solidifies the dirt almost indefinitely. And when a track really kind of drenches the surface in a soil tack slurry, people will often think that the track is asphalt or concrete, even though it is still dirt. Soil tack is so effective at grooming the tracks, it actually influenced the treads of BMX tires. Now, freestyle bikes usually run tire treads which look something like this, right? They're very, very smooth since those bikes are mainly ridden on concrete. Now, motocross dirt bikes have treads like this. They're very deep and aggressive to bite into the dirt. Old BMX race bikes also used very knobby tires since the BMX tracks were rough and sandy. Now, because the dirt is so smooth and well-groomed on modern tracks, the current generation of race bikes often have treads which look like this, even though they are marketed as BMX race tires. The treads are so shallow, they look more like freestyle tires. Now, despite dominating about 90% of race bikes, <laughs> I don't trust those tires. I see people slide out on those way too often. Personally, I prefer to run tires that are more like these. So the treads are not quite as aggressive as the old school tires, but they offer far more grip when I encounter patches on tracks which are not perfectly manicured like pavement. And speaking of pavement, it was around 2005 that some track operators began to cover their dirt berms and the turns with asphalt. And some tracks even started using paving bricks. And this was really done because it's very difficult to maintain these extremely high berms and these really high angles of dirt because once you start riding bikes over them, they just start falling apart. As I mentioned earlier, the BMX racetracks used in the Olympics with their massive starting hills and paved turns and huge pro set jumps, they were originated by the UCI as a way to make the sport more dramatic and exciting for the world stage. Now, the UCI called these tracks Supercross, like a super impressive form of motocross. And speaking of Supercross, as, as a little side note, I should mention that there are three meanings of the word Supercross in the cycling community. So Supercross is a reference to an extreme style of motocross racing where the tracks and the jumps are really massive and far more spectacular than an ordinary motocross race. Now, the same thing also applies to BMX. Supercross is also a reference to this extreme style of BMX track 
like those they use in the Olympics and during Olympic qualifying races, where the jumps are really massive and far more spectacular than an ordinary BMX race. And the third meaning of Supercross is a BMX bicycle brand based here in California. So when, <laughs> when someone in the, in the cycling community, especially the BMX community, says that, like, oh, I was watching a Supercross race, it can be hard to tell what they mean out of context, right? Like, well, was it motocross? Or was it BMX qualifiers? Or did you just see a bunch of team members from the Supercross BMX team? So it can mean a couple different things depending on the context. So these Olympic tracks are usually soil tacked on the straightaways and paved in the berms. And because the tracks are often colored with a pigment, people don't realize that the straights are still dirt. In fact, during the 2020 Olympics, the soil tack was dyed black. So the entire track seemed to be asphalt, even though it was still dirt. And when an unfortunate Olympian crashes on one of these Olympic BMX tracks, you can clearly see, nope, the surface is definitely not pavement. The dirt still kind of kicks up into the air and they have dirt on their uniform. So it is not all asphalt or pavement. Now, many of the purists of BMX, you know, they're sort of vehemently opposed to paved tracks. Personally, I understand the purist's aversion to asphalt tracks. I mean, if I wanted to race on asphalt, I'd get a road bike and dress in those goofy little spandex shorts. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, my friends and I raced in the woods and down dirt paths and gullies because the terrain itself was so much fun. We didn't race on asphalt bike trails. The whole point of BMX is to be flying over the dirt. There are three practical reasons to oppose paved tracks. First, pavement is far more dangerous. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Anyone who's ever fallen off of a bicycle can tell you crashing on asphalt or concrete hurts a lot more than crashing on dirt. Second, many tracks change their layout every few years to keep things fun and interesting, but asphalt berms force a course layout to become rather permanent because no one ever changes the layout of their track after they pave it. And the third reason that asphalt really kind of sucks like I said in the beginning, the cross in bicycle motocross means cross country, as in not on roads. The moment you start paving tracks, they become roads. Therefore, they are no longer BMX tracks because you have taken the X out of BMX. BMX is all about kids racing their bicycles on dirt paths, in the woods, down the mountainside, across the abandoned neighborhood lot, over hiking trails in the park, physically riding your bicycle on the dirt and careening through the mud is the whole point. The dirt itself is part of what makes BMX so enjoyable. You get sketchy, you start to slide out, you learn how to control a skid across the gravel. I mean, that is what makes it so much fun. It's a blast. Replacing dirt with asphalt literally eliminates one of the most fundamental elements of BMX. Could you imagine if professional dirt bike tracks started to pave their turns? That would be ridiculous. That's why they are called dirt bikes, right? If you race them on pavement, they become street bikes. However, I must extend an olive branch to track operators who pave their tracks. I cannot blame them alone. In fact, I place most of the blame on selfish spectators. 
Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, what do spectators have to do with paved BMX tracks? Well, if you ask any track operator why they are paving the turns, they never claim asphalt is safer or cheaper or more fun. They all say it's less work, less maintenance. Dirt berms require far more effort to maintain. But guess what? <laughs> if 20 people stepped up to volunteer at every race, the track operators would never consider paving the turns because there would be enough volunteers to adequately maintain the dirt. Now, I don't mean to be preachy, but it always upsets me when I attend a big race and I see 300 spectators doing nothing and only 10 volunteers are helping run the entire event. So, if you are one of the rare and noble souls who volunteer at your local track, thank you so much. Your efforts are truly appreciated. And if you never volunteer, please become one. Help the track, pitch in when you can. You don't have to volunteer every time. You don't have to volunteer for the whole race. Just sweep a little bit, water a little bit. If everyone makes a small effort, it will make a big difference. That way, we can leave the asphalt where it belongs, out in the parking lot, and make all those asphalt turns dirt again. So there you have it, folks. A brief history of BMX bikes, a brief history of BMX tracks, and a little bit of preaching. So next time you are at the top of a start hill, waiting to take a lap around the track, take a moment to appreciate the volunteers who help keep it running. Think about how your bike and tracks have evolved. And remember, in that very moment, as that gate drops, your good old days are happening right now. <laughs>